thank you so much for joining us, Aaron. You know, I'm, most people know, you know, most people joining are basically directors. So um, the whole conversation today will be largely, uh, I know you, you're often speaking to, to groups of producers and, and, you know, all sorts of different types of people that are part of the filmmaking process. But today's really um, kind of focused on filmmakers themselves and, and also sort of the growth of their careers um, and kind of the lessons that you can you can help partake <laughs> to help them kind of grow as they get to the next steps. And there's a whole mix of, of directors in the room already, but people that are very experienced um, down to people that are aspiring um, and uh, a mix of DGC members and some non-DGC members as well. Obviously, I, you know, I can give a, a brief description of sort of where you guys are now as far as obviously, you know, Braun's grown uh, over the last decade um, from being, you know, this making indie films like a lot of producers do to now being this sort of industry, you know, powerhouse working with the biggest directors in the world like Jason Reitman and others like Todd Phillips and Clint Eastwood and you know, all the amazing stuff you've done. And you have this really interesting mix of films that you've done that are all the smaller, really interesting movies, like obviously Fences and Birth of a Nation that kind of got, really grew you open and, and genre movies like Prospect that I love and, um, and Front Runner, which I saw at VIF, and, but also the huge movies like that you're, um, that some that you helped create and some that you helped finance, like the new Ghostbusters movie, which looks amazing that I'm really excited for. And I'm so uh, sad, and, it's, I'm so sad yeah. it got pushed all the way to next year, I'm sad. Uh, well, yeah. the trailer looked amazing. Um, and you know, Bombshell was one of my favorite movies uh, last year, and so Joker was my favorite movie last year. So you're already <laughs> um, kind of nailing it there. Um, but I wanted to kind of start by going back to just getting a bit of an origin story for yourself. I know Braun, in a lot of ways, was sort of your jumping point into the into the industry. What were you doing before Braun, and how, and what was how did you transition? What was Braun when it first started? Uh, well, I, um, this is actually Braun's 10 year anniversary this year, 2010 was our first year in official operation, although we started a little bit in 2009, but 2010 was our first official year uh, from British Columbia, uh, the company's roots, and that's where our parent company is, uh, up in Burnaby. Um, beforehand, I, I was in the music industry for a long time. I was a manager and I ran a publishing company and was part of recording studios and that was something I did for a really long time. And then that segued into a lot of global content licensing for a number of years. And then I had some consulting work for different finance and media related companies during the, the tech surges in parts of the 2000s as I date myself, uh, you know. And that was all part of a learning media and how media was changing at that time. I remember when everyone was talking about a one screen universe, you know, like 15 years ago. It's like if only they could see what today is like. Um, so for me, I've been in and around entertainment and media uh, for my entire like adult life. Uh, but as far as Braun is concerned, it's the last 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, something I'm really curious to hear the answer to is, you know, Lots of people start indie production companies and indie sort of, you know, film funds or whatever. Uh, but it's it's hard to think of if that as any that have gotten to the scale that you have in ten years. And I'm curious, especially in you know ones that started in Canada. I don't think anyone's ever done that. So, what do you think is the innovation or the difference that? made Braun different that sort of led to that incredible track record sort of what was the advantage or the difference compared to all the others that have tried the same thing? Well you know I, I had been working uh, and been back and forth to LA for 20 plus years just because of my former life and had a lot of connectivity in LA and uh, in the US and in Europe and other places I think so coming from when I when Braun first started, and Braun is my wife and I are the co-founders, uh, Brenda, that's the BR, and Aaron, or Aaron if you're from Quebec, uh, is the ON, but it's, it's really the two of us who started the company together 10 years ago. Um, but before that, you know, my life in entertainment, my life in, in media and, and music specifically brought me around the world. I was very fortunate, and I, I got, and I intertwined a fair bit with the film and TV business. In fact, um, the first ever uh, film that was it the first one I think it was the first ever movie that I got involved in was a film here in British Columbia by friends of mine Christine uh, Habler and Trish Dolman who run a company uh, called uh, Screen Siren in British Columbia they made a movie called Daydream Nation 
And that was the first time I got involved with the film many, many moons ago. Uh, and I had met Christine Habler on a film of hers called Kitchen Party in 1996 or 1997, something like that. So we, we that's sort of just going to happen through that that life, you know, it's sort of weird how sort of things reconnect uh, going forward. Um, but with Braun, you know, when we first started, you know, honestly, for me, in trying to start Braun, I really fell into film like it wasn't something I, I unlike others I didn't say I need to be a filmmaker that wasn't uh, that wasn't me I've been somebody who's very entrepreneurial my whole life I haven't had a real job uh literally in my adult life I, yeah I've worked for myself the whole time so I've been, same here. <laughs> yeah. what's that same here never yeah. had a job and, and and that came for through a lot of really difficult times and a lot of tough years and and leaning on others from time to time which uh you know, I, I'm fortunate enough I get to support others in the other direction now. And, you know, because I definitely, my wife and I definitely had to lean on others when we were first starting. But how does that come from here is I really, I wanted to, when I first fell into this, which was really just, you know, literally fell into it, helped help somebody on a project that went sideways and had to step in and figure out how to get a movie made. And having never been on a set before, uh, other than music video sets, I've never been on a film set before. And you know, truly didn't know my way around uh, production, but had to learn it, had to fi figure it out. And for me, more than anything, is like what I realized after getting involved in just a couple initial movies was at the time, there was really a need for some, another group in the independent film world. It was very, very hard for independent filmmakers to get movies made. Um, budgets were, you know, challenging to sort of put together for a, lo a lot of filmmakers. You know, telefilm is a great system for sure. It's a supportive system, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not the only way to get movies made, nor should it be the only way to get films made. In fact, I remember when I first met Stephanie Azam a couple of years ago, she was like, who are you? You know, because I had literally never worked <laughs> with Delvin before. And, uh, um, but now she's uh, like, what are you doing that we're not doing? I hope. Well, you know, more so like I want, I, we want to figure out together, how can I be supportive and how, you know, and how can they work with us? Because obviously, you know, hopefully we're a, a noisy Canadian company, but uh, but I think just to go back to your question, like how did it, how did we sort of do that? Honestly, it was really one foot in front of the other, like, and then seeing opportunities, you know, because our first many movies were tiny little small movies, Daydream Nation included, other films that we got involved in were very, very small, and that's all we had access to. And I was at the time putting money together, 50 grand here, 100 grand there, 200 grand there. I was like, literally, I was hustling. I was, I was hoofing it to try and make that happen. And then I was able to put together a structure to, that I could have a singular group that could get behind our movies and that's sort of how it started it just sort of me i had to kind of go through a lot to get to an initial uh structure and then that just continued forward and then and truthfully it wasn't until i met uh and connected with jason cloth who runs a company called creative wealth media out of toronto and he and i have been working you know hand in hand since i think 2014 now together so the first uh, close to four years, I was sort of doing it without a financial partner, just literally every project hoofing it. Uh, and then had, when he got involved to support our projects, uh, I think we've made 65 movies together since then. Like we've been very, very active and prolific together. And uh, it was really his support and his team support uh, and the folks are, that are behind him that enabled us to grow like we have. Do you have any advice? You know, a lot of the directors in the room and a lot of the topics that we talk about are sort of transitioning as Canadians to breaking in and sort of accessing LA and bringing like breaking into that industry and also bringing that industry back home. Like you've mm -hmm. done that in a lot of ways, similar to the same way a director has to, you've done it with your company and with, you know, all of that as a Canadian, because Canadians are, are sort of a different breed. I'm just curious if you have any advice about sort of what your, you know, you, you, you spent, a lot of time in it, but what was your journey to kind of learning the ropes of how to successfully engage with the business entities of, of LA as a Canadian? By getting the shit kicked out of me for many years first, quite frankly, uh, I, I say that it's uh, it's very true. Um, you know, we had to learn the hard way. You know, the, the first many years of Braun were a tremendous amount of trial and error um, as far as how to put things together. Um, it was sort of refining and learning how to make better choices uh, and how to budget more uh, strictly candidly at times and how to ensure that the projects that that we're looking to get involved in aren't stories that a filmmaker only wants to tell but hopefully an audience wants to see you know and what I mean by that is unfortunately 
a lot of independent movies fall into a very a category where um, the stories are are so are not as accessible as they could be. Let's just say, and I think that's a, that's uh, I think something that Canadian films have had that challenge in the past, where you know telling stories that are so localized. Uh, by no means is that across the board. There's many filmmakers, yourself included, who are not doing that. But you know, I think historically there's a, a lot of that that system in Canada sort of breeds stories in and within Canada only, and and sometimes those stories don't travel quite as well. You know, so but more than anything, yeah. you know talent will be found, you know, like if, uh, you know, finding a way to direct, finding a way to tell stories and make things, whatever those things are, uh, if you make things, you'll, you'll be able to sort of get access. And, you know, like someone like yourself, I assume you started with a Canadian agent and eventually got yourself a U.S. agent. Uh, I'm not sure if you still have a Canadian agent, but you know, like yeah. that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's the point where it's yeah. tough on the Canadian agents. I know they work hard, um, but it's, um, you know, I think, but that's the way it's done. Like the way in the same way in my world, it was done that way too, is I had to make a movie, which is honestly, my first couple movies were not that great. The ones that I produced, that is. Uh, Daydream is not one that I produced, that exact produced. But the first few movies that I produced were not as great as the next ones or the next ones or the next ones. And I think learning that uh, and also making for me, making sure that I'm working with the filmmakers that respect my position uh, as well. And, and it's a real partnership on how we work, you know? Yeah, well, I want to talk a lot about that um, later. But before we get to that, kind of building on what you were just saying, like those first few movies you were creating and eventually you made some that really started to catch on. What were lessons that you learned that you could tell a lot of the filmmakers that are watching right now? as they're trying to put their first movies together, as they're trying to kind of figure out, you know, obviously the world changes, the industry changes so quickly and, and what the world, you know, how to, how to have an indie that breaks through is, is pretty much impossible to get advice on that. But I would figure there's probably, you made a lot of those early films and learned a lot. What were lessons you learned that could be helpful for filmmakers to, to learn now to help their first few indies succeed? you know, when they're putting them together? You know, I think, I think uh, it's a great question. And unfortunately, like there's no magic ball uh, exactly, but I, I would say that um, the stories, like the stories that you're telling and that, that um, and the films that you're making, um, obviously everyone has to have a very specific voice and everyone has to have a clear vision for the story that they want to tell and, and how they want to tell it. And that's, that's critical. And, I think more than anything, you know, a lot of the initial movies that we made were very small stories at the time. And this is sort of pre Netflix and others being the kind of Goliaths that they are now, um, you know, that option of uh, we'll flip it to a streamer, which is not a real thing anymore. I think that existed for about a year. Uh, now they just make everything on their own. Um, but back then it was, I think a lot of those stories were smaller, more drama, more, um, at times wonderful human pieces, but not necessarily things that are gonna be theatrical experiences and or things that require community to really enjoy them. You know, like uh, a lot of the films we make now, I, I always, I love watching them with a lot of people. Whereas I would say a lot of films that I made in the past are things that one can experience very much on their own, you know? And I think when you're trying to make movies that can be accessible and commercial, uh, it's not just about telling a story for yourself. You have to really be looking at the audience, you know, and, and like how, who is my audience? Uh, how, how are they going to react? How are they going to receive this, this project, this movie, these characters, this story, these visuals, you know, am I, are these visuals going to distract them from the story? Or is the story going to have enough complexity to keep them interested? Or are these, are the arcs there that make sense? Do we tie it all? You know, all those things that happen, I think often with smaller indie movies, and I've made a lot of them um, sometimes, you know, I think just time it doesn't allow it to to make a perfect project if that makes any sense. I think money and time, you know, are, are two luxuries that bigger movies get to have uh, that smaller films don't have because you have to find a way to get things done so quickly. And sometimes when you move that quickly, you don't have a chance to really within the edit or really within the sound or really within whatever other element in post uh, or even in the production part, you don't always have the time to, you know, craft every element of what the story is that you want to tell. And that, that's the toughest part. You know, that's why directors like yourself always want more days, you know? So, and I get that. I get that because it, it's a, uh, it, there's a lot that you want. You want to have all those options. You want to have a buffet in front of you and figure out what you want to put on the plate and how it has to come together. That's, that's the reality that you need in the editorial 
process. And that's, I think, the hardest part of the films that we made that were smaller. I just don't think you could give them enough to be able to tell complete enough stories like we can with some of the bigger pictures that we make now. Yeah, I mean, that's not, a, that's not across experience. the board, by the way. That's uh, yeah, I know. In my experience, it's been a bit of both. You you have way less time to get it right when there's less money, but you also, in some ways, have more freedom because there's less people at the kitchen table. <laughs> I've I've noticed as money as budgets and time increase, so does politics and fear True. and all the other elements that, that no can, about that. can make, make make a movie complicated. Um, I encourage people to to continue to write. Um, questions in and we'll filter them in as we go through. I wanted to um, kind of shift over to your relationship working with directors and hiring directors. Um, can you kind of walk through, because um, there might be some more junior members, uh, directors in, that are watching, like what the, pr the hiring process is of a director? I mean, I know it's different than for each project. Sometimes it's the, the director who comes with the project or, but in the case where you, you don't have a director, but you do have a project, what is what is the process of finding someone and hiring someone? Yeah, we're in that process all the time. You know, we, we have way more scripts than we do directors attached to them uh, that are in development at Braun. Um, you know, speaking specifically on the film side, um, you know, it's, you know, if you have a creative take, you have a, have, a, have a script that you like, you have a story that you want to tell, often, you know, the first thing you're doing is looking at comps, right? Like what are other similar kinds of movies that are in this world? I enjoy doing that. I think that's an important process, but I don't like that that only limits to people who have been there before. By no means does it mean that somebody who maybe hasn't explored the thriller space doesn't mean or the action space, whatever, doesn't mean that they can't, right? So like, but you always start in that in that area because that's sort of where sort of natural that way. And you know, listen, I got to be honest, I'm a little bit spoiled in this because I have a creative a bunch of creative executives who do a lot of that work and have such a tremendous eye on the ground. Uh, at all the various global festivals and just online and keeping a, you know keeping an eye on, on young talent, which is something we do a lot. Um, you know, I, I'm very lucky that people, my team will come to me and, and suggest literally tons and tons of people and bring a lot of different ideas to the table. And um, you know, for us, like once once you sort of call that list and sort of let's say there's three, four ideas that you think this this feels good, and then you want to sit down with uh, uh, those folks. At that point in time, it's really a matter of you know them having a take for you like them being able to like that director coming in and sitting with us and talking to us about how he or she envisions that story being told and a really clear decisive take is always something that i prefer i i don't like it when someone comes in and says well i could do it like this or i could do it like that I could, you know that doesn't work for me at all um even if your take is not the take that i think think works for the film and you can talk about it thereafter but having a really specific idea on how one would you know, approach the world and approach the characters and approach it both, you know, narratively, but also visually and style-wise, like having that take, you know, it's hard to do that quickly without a lot of interaction, but I think that's the job of a director. It's not an easy job. That's why there's only 50 people on this line with us right now. There's not, <laughs> not that many people who do this who are crazy enough to do it because it's a, it is a world that you have to put yourself out there and you have to take a leap. Uh, and for me, I react to those who do that. And I'm curious because I only ever get to see my own pitches. <laughs> I'm curious, like, when those directors are, you know, you have a whole bunch of different directors come in on the same project, even if it's three or four. I'm sure. What are the ways they present that information that you find the most successful? Like, some probably come in with no material. Some come in with full keynotes. Some might just come in with a few images on their iPad. What does it all work, or are there specific things that you've been impressed by that have made the difference, or just the craft of and as someone yeah. being too. I'm like, well, for me, because I'm like a four-year-old, uh, for me, I, I don't know if you heard me, I said I'm like a four-year-old, so I enjoy, I like coloring books, and I you could try to color inside the line as best I can. Um, you know, for me, um, I, I always like to see some sort of visual, um, something visual alongside a discussion. You know, it's for me, even if it's a matter of showing a couple of images, different tones, different styles, different you know, different moods that you're sort of thinking about when you're approaching, when you're talking through somebody's vision. For me, I, I personally respond to that very much. It doesn't have to be 50, you know, images, but even if there, even if, if a course of a pitch or of a discussion, let's say between a director and a producer is happening, if that is going to be 15 minutes of a pitch or of a presentation, call it, 
there, you should show a half dozen, if not more images, not 50, you know, like, but just enough to, it's also a great guide too. Like for a director, it's a great way for them to make sure that they can find their place and work their way through an entire pitch of something. And, uh, um, but for me, I, I like to see that for sure. And it doesn't have to be moving images necessarily. It, it uh, Im, you know, images themselves, uh, the right ones are very powerful and they, they can show me somebody's thoughts and ideas. Yeah. And what are some mistakes directors have made, you know, in the hiring process that have gotten them not hired? If there's anything you want to share, because <laughs> often the mistakes are the best learning experiences and can really help people uh, well, learn from that. I'm just curious if any come to mind. One has to ask themselves, is my idea better or is it different? Right. And like that, that's the one thing that I see ha happen sometimes in, in pitches is that a, a director will present in a way where it's his or her way or the highway and you're an, you're a crazy human if you think there's any other way through this and this is the way it is the reality is is that there's so many ways to tell different stories you know and and, and i think like you know there's probably any one script you know could be approached by multiple directors and would the end result would be uniquely and very different i'm sure in every instance and so it's really about presenting your idea but then of course being open to talk through um, what the vision of the writer is, if appropriate, or the producers and what they're trying to accomplish. Like for me, you know, we have certain films that are, we know are gonna need to land with a major studio as a partner. So, because the size, the scope of the material is such that we know it's gonna be a, let's say a 25, 40, 50 million dollar movie. Um, and in that case, that's where Braun would want, need a partner with a, with a major studio to do something like that. So obviously the director that we would work with would have to be a director that if not, uh, was someone who had worked inside that system before the studio system would be somebody who would have, has had some success that we could point to in at least a film, if not more that we could point to and demonstrate the quality of the, the filmmaking. So for me, when I, when you, when the pitches come in, pardon me, when directors come in to talk about movies, you know, it really depends if we're talking about films that are going to be part of a studio partnership or their films that we're going to be more in our indie, indie world, you know? Yeah. And then, for the projects that are are coming in with directors, and maybe there's um, we have one question here from from someone, and I'm sure there's other people wondering like ones that either a writer director or they they're with they already have a script and they're coming. What are the ways that they can come to you? Like I'm sure you get that question every day. How do we how do we get our our content in front of you? Um, what is the best way of people doing that? It's the hardest thing for me to say to people, uh, but it has to come, the introduction has to come through agents or managers or lawyers. It just has to. Um, and for, for obvious reasons, Braun is, a, even if a, we were a little tiny company, it's still really important for non-solicitation stuff. We got to be careful about that. I know it's, some people don't love that notion, but for us, um, you know, if there's a manager and or agent that we know that is presenting material to us or a lawyer that we know that's presenting material to us, that's the way the first introduction would happen. That's how we would first meet somebody. Uh, and then if we felt appropriate, we would set time to, to meet with folks, uh, most of that work for us, candidly, is done out of Los Angeles. That's where our main operations are out of LA. Our, our TV group's in New York, but um, LA is where a lot of that happens. And just in case people don't understand why, can you explain why that's important? Why that's important is that, unfortunately, um, you know, there are incredibly unique stories, but there is also a lot of story. There are also a lot of stories that are similar to other stories. And, you know, what, what we have to be careful of is that if Braun, let's say three years from now makes a movie and somebody says, well, I sent that script or that's based on an idea. It's close enough to mine from four years ago. You know, we, we don't want to be in a legal issue ever. Uh, it's the same way at every studio. Uh, most places are like this where they have very firm rules around how material comes in. It's just, unfortunately in this business, um, there's a lot of that that happens that people try and get, connect themselves through uh, litig US loves litigation. So that happens quite a lot. Uh, so we just have to protect ourselves from that. Yeah. And if anyone's curious, we did a huge talk with, I think, four or five agents two weeks ago. They can find that on directors.ca, all about every question you've ever wanted to know about getting an agent. And then, so go watch that, and then you can come back, and your agent can come to Aaron and nice. make it happen. Um, and so, following up on what you were talking about earlier, sort of relationships with directors, um, I was curious myself, I was thinking about a question, and I was like, what is it that 
directors don't realize about producers? <laughs> is there something that, that we are oblivious to because we're not in that position that you always wished directors could at least see it from your perspective? Is there anything that comes to mind on that? Well, now that you ask that question, um, you know, I think um, directors who do the job properly realize that I think know, know well how hard the job of a producer is because it's not just, um, you know, there's so many elements to the job of a producer. And there's also, quite frankly, different kinds of producers, you know, um, creative producers who may just be working with the director on, on, on script and or be a great creative partner to a director, uh, helping in casting or helping with ideas, helping with crew. That's, that's a certain kind of director, and definitely I play that role with a lot of the films that we're involved in, but we also play the role of the producer that's financially responsible and setting up the companies and putting the financing together, and even if we are a partner with the studio, responsible for the deal making, responsible for the biz affairs involved, like it's a real business, you know, for making a movie, whether it's $5 million or $50 million, you know, that, that money is transacting through an entity, through a company uh, in such a short period of time. There's so much that's involved with making sure that that is all administrated properly and, and taken care of properly. And uh, all that with the goal of, of course, keeping my directors away from as much of that as possible so they can focus on making great movies. So I think the directors that I work best with uh, respect and understand that, you know, there are times I have to deal with the world that's not in front of a camera and the world that's uh, behind the camera and that gets him or her, in, you know, to be able to be in that position. Uh, but then also creatively we work together to sort of talk through our goals. Uh, as long as they're, they're clear up front, it's, uh, I've not had too many issues uh, that way. A few, a few, but, um, but yeah, like that, I think more than anything, I think respecting in the same way that a director needs to have the kind of support mechanism around them. Uh, so he or she can really, do the job properly and that's resources of time money uh access to the right people and the right skill set to accomplish what they need they need the producer to make sure they have those things and they have to also realize that a producer can't do things in a, uh can't just make things appear out of nowhere so planning is critical making sure you're communicating your needs early on um and not sort of demanding things uh or hoping for things without a runway to figure things out, just logistics or money or other. So what I mean by that is just a respectful relationship of time because the director needs time to do uh, their craft and a producer needs time to put things together properly as well. Yeah, we had our TV directing workshop uh, a few months, almost a month ago. And one of the biggest things in that workshop is if you don't ask for it, it won't be there. <laughs> yeah, be uh, you gotta ask for it early enough that you know, the budget's there for it too. Um, what, you know, what have you, what mistakes or lessons have you, can you kind of talk about as far as directors navigating sort of the, the politics and sort of of the notes process and, and collaborating with, you know, a lot of directors start out having complete creative control. They're making a short film, they're making their indie, they can do whatever they want. Mm. And then they graduate into being an employee who has a lot of creative say <laughs> and has a vision, but ultimately doesn't have the final say. Um, and there's ways of making that relationship and that collaboration really healthy. And there's ways of making poisoning it and yeah. making it really difficult. Um, what, you know, you've probably had all of those experiences, I would imagine having made so many movies. What, what advice do you have sort of about navigating the politics of, dealing with notes and the creative freedoms with yourself or with the studio, even if you agree with the director, sometimes you don't have a final say. Yeah, well, those, those are a couple of different questions because uh, there it does happen that I work and have, you know, want to support a director and, and, and agree with a, uh, a note or agree with a direction, um, uh, yet know that our studio partner doesn't like it and have to find a way to, you know, make that work. That's where my old life in management, what have you, uh, comes in handy. Um, you know, um, it, it, God, it, it, there's just so many things that happen through that process. I think more than anything, you know, the, the relationship between a director and a producer um, is should and never should never be an adversarial one. You know, uh, they things at times, you know, get discussed and discussed in a heated way only because the goal is to achieve a, a common goal, right? A, a common vision for something. If you don't have a common vision, you shouldn't be working together on that project. And I think that's sort of where I would come back to is to say a lot of that needs to be figured out early before the process starts. Like if you if you're not lock sync uh, creatively 
and, and as a filmmaker, aware of your budget and time and other limitations that you have to work through. Like if you discover that while, uh, you know, while you're filming, that's not fair to you. Uh, you need to, the producer has to be clear and make sure you understand the sandbox you're working in uh, up front. And conversely, you know, directors have to be respectful of what they have to work in. Like it's very hard. Like that's why contingencies are there, and that's why discussions are there, and that's why there's a it's a team sport making movies. It's uh, there's no one person that can do it. And a thousand times I had a conversation with the directors. Like, listen, I got it. You know, this is something I need. I got to do that. I'm like, okay, we can do this, but you're gonna have to lose something else, right? This is this is the trade off that happens. So, and that's something I'm sure you've experienced many times. It's like if something uh, is that important, um, which it is at times, absolutely. Um, you know, those are the kinds of conversations that you have that can be healthy, but, and that's during the process. However, as much as possible needs to be discussed before. And that's the part, that's what I've learned the hard way is, uh, I think a number of times, especially early on, uh, for me, not having a good enough understanding of the vision of my filmmaker, um, and not fully understanding how they wanted to realize everything in a script, like in all the prep meetings and all the discussions, but not having dug down deep enough to really understand a few things, uh, especially the more difficult shots that can often uh, hurt indie movies if they're not you know, executed properly. Or um, So for me, I think that that is a process of development and packaging and working together and really, really, really understanding upfront then then shit's going to happen throughout the process absolutely that's the way it goes you're fighting fires every day when you're making projects making movies uh, but you don't want to make it harder for yourself if you don't at least enter the game together on the same page you know, yeah i think you don't, you're in trouble that was probably the biggest lesson i learned early in my career i'm glad you brought that up early that i have I have films on IMDb with, or Rotten Tomatoes with like 100%, and I have a film with 0%, and the film with 0% was a situation where we didn't, it happened so quickly that we didn't have time to date before we started. No. And it turned out we had completely different movies that we were wanting to make. And, and there's not a lot, once you're already in it, um, that can be really difficult. So yeah. being early on, trying to make sure, even before you take the job, that you want to make the same project is, is yeah, very cool. critical. You, very you, won't, you won't end up with a strong result unless you, you go into it on the same page. It won't happen. Yeah, definitely. Great, very important, great advice. So you've worked with some of, you know, the top directors in the world. What if, you know, is there something that, are they just like the rest of us or is there something that <laughs> you've learned from them or admire from them that, you you've kind of can tell why they've gotten to that level is there anything you can kind of partake for all of us who want to be at that level like what you've noticed of the people that are working at the top top of the industry uh i gotta be so careful how i answer this i got all sorts of <laughs> uh, listen what i can say about those who are incredibly creative is that often those who are incredibly creative uh, have other aspects of their life that may not be as developed as the creative side of their life. <laughs> How's that sound? That sounds great. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think more than anything, it's just, I just, I think knowing each other is really critical. It's really important, uh, is understanding how that, how, you know, knowing again, like that's all part of the development of the project itself. But I think just knowing who you're working with and understanding how best she, I think I'm answering the last question. Ask me that question again. I think I went in the wrong direction for it. <laughs> I mean, I was just curious, like you work with such great people and I've, I listen to interviews, you know, with such top directors and often I just hear they work their ass off. They work harder than anyone. You know, yeah. Than that's a common trait. That's, that's no doubt. Cause that's a common trait as well, because you know, the life of a director is a tough life, you know, because you work for such a long period of time to then have such a short period of time to try and get everything that you want, um, you know, on, you know, capture. You know, and, and you want every single second of that time to be as efficient as possible. And you want every second of that to be capturing images that you then have to sort of make, you know, make your project with. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a hard, again, like, I'm sorry, I'm not speaking very well today. It's, it's Friday afternoon. It's a long, <laughs> forgive me. You have uh, a long weekend coming up. It's good. What's that? You have I'm a long open. weekend coming up. Well, the U.S. is open on Monday, so I'll be open on Monday. Um, you know, I, again, I think it's really a matter of understanding and, and having that, you know, those directors that I've worked with have that 
there's something about them that sort of is, is a unique. It's almost like when you've, meet, you've met people in your life that has a level of, have a level of charisma. When you meet, you know, there's people that walk in a room and somehow the, the air just sort of feels different in the room. You know, I've been in a room with uh, Denzel many times and the second Denzel walks, sorry to name drop, forgive me. <laughs> the second Denzel walks in the room, it's like literally you can feel the air in the room kind of gone. There's only a few humans like that. And in their own way, every director has that. I think it has the ability to be, has to have the ability to be a leader. Uh, and it's tough on certain directors who are a bit more uh, insular and maybe don't communicate as well. That's a tougher role to be in, in my opinion, because I find like a director is really how everybody is looking to, starting with your number one, that is looking to, to lead uh, and to have the confidence and to know what's what. And I think the best directors that I deal with are those that come so incredibly prepared. Like the, I made a movie with Jason, you mentioned Jason Reitman. Reitman and I made a film together um, called The Front Runner a few years ago. Uh, and uh, Hugh Jackman was our star of the movie. And that guy and worked just as hard as Jason did. Like the two of them came with like binders of history information. And like we're talking, they needed to know absolutely everything about not just uh, the character of Gary Hart that that he was playing, but in the case of Jason, about everything about that world, everything that everything everything that enveloped the world during that time, he had to understand it. So not just our movie, but everything that like, everything was happening in the world around what was going on inside our movie, and that even to the point where one thing he did every day, which was amazing, is that all of our actors he would give news clippings from that day in history. So what that wow. day in history, they would read about what was going on in the world. Uh, before we shot. So they sort of, again, further got into character, further kind of felt more connected to the story that he was telling. But Jason did stuff like that. Other filmmakers I work with just really have that unique passion and voice that and leadership ability that's so critical. Um, and, I, and again, like that, having your number one work and follow and lead uh, with your directors is the most critical thing. Um, you know, those, those two have to be in such sync. Uh, and if they're not, everything about the production feels it, you know? Yeah. Well, I recommend anyone check out The Front Runner. It's a fantastic film. It's very timely. It, kind it of wasn't timely, unfortunately. It killed us because, you, you know, there's this American president who's a little, let's just say... It's so person. essential watching. Yeah. It's just What's like, that? The movie's so essential because you watch it and you forget that that's how the world even was. Yeah, but unfortunately, we tried to take the movie out at a period of time when the the U.S. president is a, a, a let's just say a, a slightly different kind of character that uh, uh, Gary Hart looked like a saint. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I didn't notice. Um, anyway, I want to transition now in the last uh, 15 minutes just to answer the questions that have been coming in. Sure. One great question uh, that someone asked was, you know, when when agents and pr are bringing you stuff on behalf of their clients, what is it that you're looking for? Um, what elements would help it rise up the chain through all your executives into you that would really make you know is there a certain taste is there a certain genre is there a certain package um is it a certain type of story what, what are you looking for a complete story uh does, I'm, i am very genre agnostic if you see the films that i've made last year i may i was i was either financier like exec producer uh, or producer behind everything from the good liar to Joker, to Bombshell, to Queen and Slim, and like those movies are all over the place. So I'm, I'm genre agnostic, it comes down for me. It's what's on the page is the first thing and the most important thing. That's what, I, that's what we're all driven by. Uh, uh, the script has to, be, has to be something incredible. And then secondly, the vision that uh, a filmmaker has for how they're gonna tell that story is most, most critical, most, most critical. But for me, when we're reading, when we're looking at things, and we've made like people say what's i appreciate it it's not so easy to get a first movie made or to get uh even a second movie made sometimes it's not so easy to do um but we are we're always looking like we're all we're reading a lot like a lot of it comes through agents that we're that we're very close with we're very fortunate that we have a lot of people that are always sending us stuff uh but we have to be careful with that too because so much comes in you have to find ways how do you differentiate how differentiate wrong word how do you get through all of that properly with an open, you know, mind to different kinds of stories. If you're just reading 12 hours a day, you just can't, you know, uh, in my opinion. Um, yeah. So, so what are the, like, are there things that you look for that like, just maybe not just the story, of course you want great stories and great coverage or whatnot, but if other elements they, that they they could add to it, that would help it get your attention. I think, you know, I'm not so worried about people packaging with talent. That's something we know how to do well, but when something comes in with from a writer or director, 
Um, again, if it's a, someone who is intending to direct, obviously we want to be familiar with something that they would have done before. Uh, and if not a feature, we want to see shorts, we want to see other work that they've done. Uh, we have made several movies with first time filmmakers, by the way, um, including very recently. Um, so for me, it's not about having to had a feature film before, but relative to the property itself, you know, we want something that feels uh, unique and something that obviously has a quality level to the writing itself and has a clear vision from the filmmaker as to how they would approach writing it. So we, we re, every time we, there's a director vision and a director board, like that's not BS, just so you guys know, we, we look at all that stuff. It's really important for us to have an understanding. And when we see something from a writer director, especially, we don't want to just get a, a script from them. We want to see, I want to see some visuals. I want to see what they see. You know, like what kind of thoughts, that, what kind of lighting, what kind of angles, what kind of ideas are they thinking about when, uh, so if they're sending us the script and we see something that's, you know, very different visually from what we read on the page, that that would be off-putting, obviously. We would, we would not be excited about that, you know? So yeah. for me, uh, as much uniqueness and quality in writing, uh, uniqueness and a clear vision and a director statement and, and in any materials that are supplied, that's, that's what gets us to look towards. There's a few questions just sort of about you know, the state of the world right now, as far as what do you type, what type of stories do you think the world's, have you changed your shift towards the type of stories you wanna make? And also sort of what does the indie world look like with sort of, you know, the, <laughs> the closing of theaters and all that type of stuff. You could say, I have no idea, but there's a few questions about sort of what's your crystal ball saying? Yeah, well, I wish my crystal ball was answering me right now. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm not gonna lie, it's a scary time right now. It's, there's so many unknowns. Um, you know, for us, we are just keeping our pedal to the metal. Like we had, we were hurt uh, quite badly by the stoppage. You know, we had multiple shows um, in production or heading into production and including Deb Patel's directorial debut. See, we make first time filmmaker movies uh, that we were shooting in India, which now looks like it won't even be possible for the rest of the year. Um, so, you know, for us, um, you know, we got knocked down and continue to get knocked down because as of right now, like our, we're a partner, you know, in different companies as well. So between all the different companies, I think we've got something like 11 projects that have pushed uh, or been shut down. So it's, it's, been, it's been challenging, I'm not gonna lie. And part of what we've just had to figure out how to do is how to make our way through that. Fortunately, we have an animation studio that we're leaning in on a lot now and getting a, a lot put through that, which is great because we can produce remotely. And thankfully we got strong partners uh, financially behind us. Thank you, Creative Wealth. Um, but it's um, for us right now, like what does the indie market look like? Honestly, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure right now. Like uh, I know that for us, we are focused more on a big movies that we're making with studios at a big budget, temple, bigger films. Uh, not necessarily temple, but bigger bigger films with studios that can be broad and be very, very star driven or very smaller, uh, much smaller movies than normal. We're staying out of that middle area, which we sort of lived in for a lot of years, um, just because that middle area is in that world where is it too big to, if it, you are going to sell into one of the streamers uh, or if you are with an indie distributor and hopefully many will make it through this time, um, you know, you have to make sure you're in a number that is... Uh, yeah, risk mitigated, you know, I don't know how else to say it, you know, right now, like it's, I don't know what, uh, you know, A24 are good friends of ours, we've made a lot with them. And, you know, we have David Lowry's movie with them right now that just got pushed till next year. Uh, the release of it got pushed till next year, it's called The Green Knight. And, you know, with a film like that, it's like A24 is the best in the business at marketing for indie films, they have the most unique marketing and other but, you know, we talk to them all the time. And there's so many unknowns right now, there's just nobody knows if, uh, what is the theater experience going to be like in August versus October versus January? Um, we'll see. So for us, we are working hard and acting as if everything is going to get back going by in production by August is what we're working for, working towards. I have friends who are doing things next month and in July, which honestly we're not ready to, we're not comfortable with that. Uh, or we have like an in-house production task force, my head of, of production is interacting with many different studios and really working together, health and safety before we go back. But so for us, you know, what's the, what does it look like for independent movies? You know, independent movies will thrive, they will survive, they will get through this. Uh, where they get consumed, um, that is a, a question, you know, how they'll get consumed. But I think, um, you know, for us, we're just gonna continue moving forward with everything right now as best we can. Uh, and then we'll just react, you know, we'll be ready to shoot this summer. And if we can't, we'll 
we'll continue to push and, and develop other things until we can. And I, I know the answer to this, but I know a few people have asked it. Um, you know, you guys are based in, in BC, but working on the global stage. Do you consider Canadians? <laughs> uh, you know, are you looking for, for local talent? Um, I know you are, but a lot of people wonder that. Absolutely. Um, you know, our, our business definitely has shifted down south over the years. Uh, so how we're set up is our, our lead creative production, marketing, biz affairs, some of our finance people are all based out of LA. Uh, that's all for film and a little bit of TV. But our main TV is out of New York. And then Vancouver or Burnaby, we have an animation facility uh, and have our back office, our corporate staff are up in British Columbia, our post accountants and accountants are here and our corporate uh, finance group. So that's sort of how we're shifted to Toronto. We have a few biz affairs people that are in Toronto. So it's th those four centers and then we're partner in companies uh, in London and other places. But um, absolutely, it's a huge mandate for us to find Canadians and to work with and develop, uh, you know, uh, more and more talent here in Canada. Um, absolutely, it's something that we want to do. We've been involved with some sponsoring a number of different events uh, over the last little while, and that's something we'll continue to do as well. Um, so, yes, definitely yeah. excited I'm to... I'm curious to kind of um, follow up on that about um, where are those places that sort of you first see talent just because I think that's helpful for Canadians to know just for when they're creating stuff sort of knowing where they should aim not necessarily just specifically for you but how to make stuff that then gets noticed by people that can you know lead to opportunities like are is it the big film festivals is it um is it big, stuff big and small online? Yeah. big big and small film festivals I would say you know because I you know we've met and have found incredible people at the you know at uh smaller festivals like South by or um, Edinburgh or other places we've met filmmakers uh, in the past. We've also met many out of Sundance and uh, Toronto and uh, Berlin and Venice, et cetera. So yeah, um, you know, get, getting your work seen is, is whether that's a short film uh, or a feature length film, um, getting it seen, getting it into festivals, getting it into uh, uh, other kinds of ways that people can view it. You know, uh, um, I think, um, even if you have agents that are representing you and making sure that, you know, folks like me and my team are, are seeing are aware of who you are, aware of the material you have, aware of your talents. Like it, ha it happens a lot. It, it happens a lot. Like we're making a movie um, with a young filmmaker. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of, uh, of an online series called Brown Girls. Uh, Brown Girls is an online series that was uh, the filmmaker behind it was uh, uh, Sam Bailey and Samantha, um, Sam, Honestly, she they made that for like twelve dollars, uh, and it what you could you know the quality of it was pretty good, but you could tell it was a low budget online show. But she had such a unique voice and got so much out of her actors and got so much out of the world that she created uh, that when we then got pitched a movie that she wanted to be part of, we were sold at her capabilities. Uh, to be able to to envision that that film because we saw her do that for twelve dollars uh, uh, and on her own and with such such few resources but her and her creative team did a beautiful job and uh, and we sort of and then her clear ideas about how she would make that movie we were uh, we were drawn to her and, and signed off on her you know and it will be yeah, here um, hopefully shooting this year we'll see sorry pardon me strong voice. Um, one last question, which Louisa asked, which I think is a great question and something I've been, um, I've experienced when interviewing department heads, is have you noticed um, a difference between the way Canadians pitch and Americans pitch? And what is, if there is a difference, what is it? And what can Canadians do to compete um, hmm. uh, in that scenario when, when, you know, they're two different cultures, there's one job, the producers are sitting there. Have you noticed a difference or, or, or not? You know, honestly, I, I, I myself have not noticed a, dis a difference. You know, you as a filmmaker are more intimate with your creative departments than, than I would be, you know, like I'm, I'm hiring often the line, I'm hiring you. <laughs> and then I'm, then I'm relying on you to find those, the creative uh, folks that you want to help you realize your vision uh, or giving you ideas on those who could help you do that. Uh, you know, for really that's how I've worked historically. Like when I'm working with a filmmaker, um, you know, we of course want to have, want to weigh in on the creative team that are around that filmmaker, especially the director of photography and other, other skills that are around helping, helping bring a story to life. 
but if I don't believe in the vision of that filmmaker, I shouldn't be making that movie. So a lot of those details that you're talking about in those pitch meetings with, whether that's costume head or, or production designer or set tech or whatever, I'm not necessarily in those uh, meetings, to be honest with you. I'll hire you. Uh, okay. I'll hire the line producer. I'll hire the, you know, a few other key, key folks. And, uh, but uh, I myself haven't noticed a difference. I think in both cases, you see people who are successful uh, at, at presenting a clear vision and being a team, you know, showing that they're a good teammate. Uh, you see those people who are good at it, those who are not so great at it uh, on both sides of the board. You know? Yeah, uh, yeah, we've had lots of conversations about sort of how to pitch and present yourself in the rooms. And, and in a lot of the cases, it's been our experience that because a lot of people come up especially on the crew side in Vancouver, there's a lot of opportunity compared to in LA. In LA, the people that rise are really good at, at presenting themselves because there's so few jobs for how many people there are. So the people that eventually get chosen have to develop those pitching skills. Whereas in Vancouver, on the service end, there's so many jobs compared to the amount of people that people can get work without really, really, really developing those pitching really? skills. And then they finally get to a level um, where they're pitching against Americans, they get completely outpitched um, mm -hmm. just from lack of practice. So we've been trying to do a lot to kind of really develop those skill sets. Um, yeah, I got it. Got it. But uh, thank you so that's much, that's Aaron. That's We're that's very... <laughs> um, well, we've run out of time, but we just want to say thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Uh, and um, we're going to be making this talk available on directors.ca where people can check out all the other talks we've done as well as the industry's best database for finding Canadian directors. Um, and so thank you so much, Aaron, for joining and people can find out more about Bronze Studios at Bronze thank Studios you, on social media and at Watch DGC. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Pleasure. <laughs>